world should understand one thing if we fall every european country will fall this is what's gonna happen to your streets this is what's gonna happen to your civilian families i'm sophie ko and this is ukraine the latest it's tuesday the 26th of july day 153 and today is another very special episode as i said yesterday our usual host david knowles and our defence and security editor, Dom Nichols, are currently in the Ukrainian capital city of Kyiv. Over the next seven days, we'll be hearing from David and Dom as they meet prominent Ukrainian politicians, visit some significant locations of the war so far, and speak to those who are experiencing the struggle firsthand to hear their stories. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Today, Dom and David met Mayor of Kyiv, Vitaly Klitschko. He appears briefly at the end of this episode, and you can hear their full interview in tomorrow's episode of Ukraine The Latest. But first, this morning, David Knowles was shown around Kyiv by local resident Anna Vertsan, who regular listeners of the podcast might remember from an earlier episode. It's worth noting before you listen that this interview is pretty emotive and does contain some strong language. Good morning, everybody. This is David Knowles from Ukraine, the latest, and The Telegraph uh, reporting from Kyiv. It's a beautiful morning here in the Ukrainian capital, and I'm joined by one of our interviewees from the past few months, Anna Vertsan, who's met me here. We are in Tarashevchenko Park, uh, just opposite the Cathedral of St. Vladimir. Uh, it's an absolutely beautiful morning. Anna, you've been showing me around the park. Uh, what, what have we seen? Okay, we've seen our uh, one of the oldest parks in Kyiv. Uh, it was scientific botanical garden and uh, founded in uh, 1839. Um, beautiful old park. So, and also I think uh, you saw a bit of normal life in Kyiv. A, a little bit of normal life. I mean, you mentioned that the the traffic today is it's still extremely low. It's a bit mm-hmm. like a did you say it's like a Saturday morning? Because so many people have left the city still. Uh, Yes, it looks more like a usual Saturday morning in Kiev before the war. Uh, also, lots of people just don't want to use their cars uh, because it's expensive petrol and so they're just saving, <laughs> they're saving their money and using public transport. And it's, and it's interesting, just to give listeners a sense of where we are, to our right is a beautiful small coffee shop and there are really, there's really not many signs of the conflict here. I mean, there's a, there's a man in military uniform on the phone with his bag sort of opposite us. He's been sitting there a while. And as you said, the, the traffic is fairly low. But a, apart from that, in this, the, the heart of Old Kyiv, the sort of the, the old park, um, there's really not many signs. So ju- just very quickly, because we'll, we'll, just listeners will go on a little tour of Kyiv and see some of the interesting things here that Anna's been kind enough to show, show us. Taras Shevchenko, who is he and what does he mean to Ukrainians? Uh, Taras Shevchenko, uh, is, uh, he's a poet and uh, mainly uh, he's like uh, William Shakespeare for the uh, Great Britain. So um, we also call him sometimes our prophet because uh, why is that a uh, prophet? Because he lived and wrote his poems uh, in in Russian Empire. So uh, basically, <laughs> almost every his word is uh, very suitable for the modern situation. Uh, just not to trust Russians, not to communicate with Russians, and uh, don't have business with them. So the um, imperial uh, stuff, so uh, the history repeats itself. So, uh, well, uh, nowadays we say that he was right. <laughs> that imperial past, you can sort of see it all around you in the center of the city, opposite where we're sitting. We can, we can just see the golden dome above the, the coffee shop and above the trees is the Cathedral of St. Vladimir, um, built by the Tsars when when um, Ukraine was part of the Russian Empire. And in, the, and in the park itself, we mentioned we saw some statues. I mean, we've seen Mahatma Gandhi, a statue of Gandhi, gifted by the Indian Embassy. We've also seen a, a Korean poet who, who wrote about Korea and, its, uh, and his, Korean his beautiful nation, Korean nation. people, yeah. So you get the sense of the, the colonial and the anti-colonial in, in this yes, space. Yes, you're right, absolutely. And I never thought about that this way, but uh, it's true. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the, the coffee. It's also delicious. So Anna has very kindly just produced a small envelope of stamps for us to take away. There is a card, there are some stickers, stamps, and 
there are some smaller uh, stamps that you'd, you'd have to lick the back of and put in an envelope. These are quite famous, aren't they, Anna? What, what are we looking at? Shall we start with the very famous one? This is okay. the, the Russian warship stamp. So it's, uh, all this stuff is made by our uh, Ukrposhta, so National uh, Post Service, and uh, this is uh, the copy of the most famous stamp. So just to describe what it looks like, we've got a, a, the, the Moscow warship a Ukrainian soldier facing it, facing away from the, the viewer's perspective, holding, the, give, giving it the finger. Yeah, giving <laughs> the middle and finger. What does what does that say at the bottom? Uh, it says Russian warship uh, go three dots and. Uh, <laughs> I think we can say it. If, if 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 our producers would like to bleep this later, that's absolutely okay, fine. Okay, <laughs> it says uh, Russian warship go fuck yourself. What, um, how do you say that in, in Ukrainian? What's uh, Russki vojenny korabel idi nahui. Uh, and this, we've got another set this, of... Oh, this sorry. was uh, the second stamp, oh, right yeah. after... The, it, it was launched the next day, uh, after the warship was uh, done. So uh, uh, they are very linked and they are very popular, but I managed to get this, <laughs> this special <laughs> for, you so for you guys from Telegram, for you. And, uh, and just at the, at the bottom of that, it also says, uh, it says, Russian warship done, death to the enemies. I yes, mean, uh, we have, uh, this is our quote, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it has a uh, few parts. So we say, Slava Ukraini, Heroem Slava. It means glory to Ukraine, glory uh, to our heroes. The next part is uh, Slava Nazi Smert Vorham, Ukraina Ponaduse. So Slava Ukraini, so, gl glory to Ukraine, glory to our heroes, glory to nation, death to the enemies, and uh, Ukraine is uh, above everything. So that's the first set of stamps with the, with the Moskva ship, the very famous episode from early in the war with the Ukrainian soldiers telling the, the Russian warship to go fuck itself. And we've got a second set, set of stamps and a card yep. here. Um, so just for our listeners, we're, we're looking at a, a large plane on the left. It's a children's drawing and a, a blonde haired girl in a blue dress who's, who's sort of flying with flowers coming out of her arms. We can put a picture on this on the website later. Uh, this is the drawing by Sofia Kravchuk. She's 11 years old and she won the competition and uh, the, now it's a stamp. It's one of the, uh, from this series of uh, uh, our um, wartime stamps that all have some, they're meaningful. Uh, you can see the uh, biggest plane in the world. Uh, it's now crashed, but we still have our dream. Mm. Uh, you can't destroy our dream. So you can see the girl flying and dreaming and uh, it's very nice. Well, thank you very much, Anna, for that explanation. And we'll, we'll put uh, pictures of these either on the live blog or on the website later. And I can certainly share them on my own uh, Twitter as well, so you can see what we're talking about. So it's 11 o'clock in the morning. Anna and I are standing right next to the Golden Gate, a reconstructed uh, gate of Kiev, the, the original medieval entrance to the city. Uh, there's a metro station just opposite us. And I wanted to pause because it's quite quiet in this park. It's probably a good place. Um, Anna, as we were walking up, we passed the um, National Opera House and everything looks very peaceful. There are people sitting in the cafes, going to lunch. And then we see on the side of the road a collection of tank traps just, wait, just waiting there. And I know you wanted to talk a bit about how uh, Ukrainians have adapted to the war and, and how you carry on. Uh, yeah, we have uh, an opinion in our society and a uh, lot of psychologists uh, confirm this, that our ability to adapt is very, very high. Uh, it's our uh, national thing and uh, it helps us to survive, to go through the wartime and to, to try to live a normal life. So this uh, national character of adapting is helping us psychologically a lot to go through this period. And how, how are you and your friends now? How have you dealt with the five months of the conflict? I mean, you said, it, you said earlier there's, there's a lot of depression at the moment. How, how are people dealing with that? Yeah, lots of people very depressed. We are a nation of 40 million people with PTSD. So, and, and we'll have to deal with it uh, after uh, the war uh, finished. And we are already trying to deal with it. We have lots of uh, psychological, free psychological help and uh, free, uh, free lines of uh, support lines. And you can talk to specialists and uh, it's a government program and local programs and lots of psychologists just doing their volunteering job 
to help other people to get through this. It's a, a very strange feeling visiting here, I think, because when you're looking around now, I mean, you know, we can see restaurants on the side of the road there, which are full, cafes which are full. There's a group of children walking past. Are they on a school visit or something? What, what, what do you think yeah, they're doing? Yeah, it's kind of excursion. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the, it's just uh, kids, uh, I don't know, six years old, five years <laughs> old, <Yeah. laughs> going, walking around and looking at the uh, uh, historical monuments and buildings and uh, teacher talking to them about about the, all this stuff, the normal stuff to the yeah. kids in, uh, in summer. And uh, listeners, it's an absolutely beautiful day here in Kyiv. There are families out. We've seen quite a few guys in military uniform with, with their families. And Anna, you said you mentioned that you're not actually allowed to carry a gun, carry weapons yeah. in the centre. So we've not seen any weapons. We've just seen, I just wanted to pick us up here because we've seen an incredibly peaceful city, but just these signs of the conflict in the background. And that's the. And you also see a lot of police yeah, around. Yeah, yeah. And they are fully, uh, they have full ammunition with the uh, everything on and well um, they are little signs of wartime but mostly people trying to uh, live a normal normal life as much as it's possible yeah where, where are we going next oh you'll see, you'll see. it's a surprise <laughs> <laughs> fantastic okay so anna and i have walked to the other side of the center of kiev we're looking we're standing in a big central square on one end of, of a long street here is St. Sophia's, a museum church. We've just been inside, so we can see the golden dome of that uh, against the backdrop of the blue sky with the clouds scudding across. On the other side, the other end of the street, is St. Michael's. And in front of us, right in front of us, just a couple of feet away, are a collection of destroyed Russian vehicles. We've got tanks, we've got some civilian cars as well that were destroyed by the Russians in their attack. In the towns near Kyiv, we've got a howitzer. Anna, can you tell us a little bit about this place? Um, what, are we, what are we looking at? What does it mean to you as a Ukrainian? Sure. Um, you know, I have uh, controversial feelings because this is uh, Michael Square. This is a very memorable place for our revolution in 2014. And the Michael, St. Michael's Church is also a very memorable place uh, for the revolution and uh, all this time. And on the other side, we have the most precious architectural masterpiece of our country one of them and this uh, you know barbaric stuff they brought to to destroy us to destroy our legacy so very controversial from one side i i love this place i love everything connected to this place and the hate <laughs> i have to this vehicles to the uh, we are looking at Panzer S1 self-propelled anti-aircraft missile system. Well, and you, can, came, you can say you can to, to you can kill. smell it, can't you? You can smell yes. the, the metal and the. It's, we're standing burnt, very very burnt close. Metal. Yeah. And you can see that the wires sort of blasted out. And there are scorch marks on the on the rims of the wheels. I'm very happy. It's so damaged, and I hope those who were inside of these cars they were dying slowly. This is you can see the tires completely ripped off, and the, the metal yes. is buckled and jarred. And the uh, the anti aircraft gun, one of the guns, the, both of the guns are still pointing straight at the sky, but this entire vehicle is is r sort of rusty and bronze, and it's been completely destroyed. And, and also, you can see the uh, sand and all the dirt yeah. it was in, so they so just brought it, brought it here as it was found. Uh, and right next to it is a um, let's have a look a 152 millimeter MSTA self propelled howitzer, and the 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 door has been blasted open, and you can just see inside, and it's absolutely. You can, again, you can smell the metal, you can smell the explosion that must have ripped this thing. So I'm just ducking under the barrel yes. of the tank there. It's a horrible feeling to see this stuff. I mean, it's, we, there's some, some, some clothes, there's some burnt clothes on the, yes. on the top, just with a hole in it, and some another buckled entrance to the tank there. Let's just have a look around this side, and you can see that the tracks of, the, of this howitzer are, are sort of melted and Gosh, I mean, it's it's an awful, awful, yeah. awful thing. And there's some Ukrainian written on it. Well, Anna, what does that uh, say? Yeah, it said for Mikolai, for her son, and for Mariupol. I mean, looking at this, you don't imagine the people in this when, when missile struck got out alive. And also, you can see on the uh, another machine, you see uh, it's written for Mariupol, for Izum, for Crimea, and uh, glory to. Uh, yeah. There's lots Army. of writing on this, isn't there? Yes, yeah. a lot of, <laughs> lots and lots of uh, very um, offensive stuff <laughs> about Russians. 
So we've just we've just done a tour of the sort of military vehicles. So we've looked at tanks and howitzers and self-propelled howitzers and, and also another look battle how tank. Many children and children yeah. are like looking on. There's a child the in a green yes. shirt climbing on top of the tank, smiling. I think he's yes, his, his dad for or his him. guardian is going to take a picture. Yeah. I think for it's uh, it's good that they don't understand. Children don't understand yeah. completely what's going on and uh, what is it, what it's all made for. Um, but on the other side, uh, well, we should uh, uh, teach yeah. the next generation. I mean, this is half a museum, half a sort of... Yes, it's exhibition, yeah. museum, and also to show... We, I think uh, one of the aims is to show the uh, world, all the uh, uh, guests of the city, uh, what's been going on. So in front of us, it's not just military vehicles here. So in front of the howitzers and the tanks and and the missiles, um, there are two civilian vehicles. Um, one is a, a, a green family car. Um, on the front it has um, children written in, in Russian. What's, yes, how do you, it's what's written that? in Russian. It's, uh, the word is uh, dieti, dieti in Russian, yeah. kids. Uh, in English, it's just, yeah. just pieces of paper taped. And uh, you can see there, uh, this is the uh, uh, driver's door. And it's got one, two, three, four, five, one. six bullet holes in it. Look at the uh, piece of the cloth. Yeah. They asked, uh, they told the civilians to put some white cloth, uh, pieces of cloth uh, on their cars to, uh, to safely, as they told, uh, get out of the uh, occupied uh, or danger places. And uh, as you can see, it didn't And just looking inside, you've got smashed With, glass. There's yeah. something dried on that seat. I, mean, I think we can imagine what that might be. And there's also uh, the front windscreen. It's been, sh it's been shattered and there's, there's a hole yeah. kind of in between the driver and then the passenger seat with the bullets gone again that must have gone straight yes. through and smashed the glass at the back and there's children written on the front and, and you can see uh, they uh, tried to smash the engine oh yeah yeah definitely this in the middle of the uh, front part so of the car. just the note on this says uh, it's a Mitsubishi Pajero and this entire belonging to a family from Butcher on March the 14th 2022 that's the bells of St Michael's just going for quarter past 12 here um, on the March 14th, 2022, during an attempt to evacuate from occupied territories, the cars were shot at. Um, oh, I see, sorry, the sign is for both, for both cars, yes, I see. Yes. So we've got three, three adults and six children, man and woman were severely wounded, so they, they did get out. Um, and these are just, it's, so in the background, just to sort of go back to the scene here, we've got St. Michael's Cathedral. I'm looking at this picture and, you know, you totally... I, I, I don't know, it's so devastating, it's very yeah. hard to look at this and you you just think of all the, uh, uh, all the people's lives, children's lives just taken, but why? Because they want more territory, that's all. You know, I, I'm thinking about like this family having this uh, family-sized car with their children going to the sea, to Odessa, to see the... Uh, uh, dolphins and uh, yeah. just to have a nice time and definitely they didn't think that at one point this car will be and and with them inside burned just that's awful that's sorry it's all i think can think about i really i really wish russians to open their eyes or just to feel all everything we we felt we feel and st we still going through we, we have ongoing war i will i really wish them to feel the horror the uh, how scared scared we were and how scared we are we just we, we can't live our lives we have so many people died just civilian people children and i really wish them to feel what we feel. Thank you very much Anna for, sh for showing me this um, and to everybody at home this has sort of really brought home the I mean that, that self-propelled how it's just in front of us that's a huge I mean that's absolutely terrifying. And you know also world should understand one thing if we fall every European country will fall this is what's gonna happen to your streets this is what's gonna happen to your civilian families you just have to every single country have to understand this thank you Anna and thank you all for listening 
This afternoon, Francis Sternley, assistant comment editor at The Telegraph, and I sat down to discuss the latest updates from the war as we usually do. And just as we were wrapping up, we were joined by a very special guest from Kyiv. But before that, I started by asking Francis about the strike on the city of Mykolaiv today. Yes, it's been another significant 24 hours when measured on this question of the grain deal. And uh, we spoke at length yesterday about why it would appear that Russia are continuing to bombard port cities, ports uh, across Ukraine when this deal has been signed. And I made the point that it's straight from the Russian playbook to use diplomacy as a weapon, as a delaying tactic, so that then when they renew assaults, it uh, it, it means that they've gained time in order to be able to, to, to do so in a more effective manner. So that may be what's happening here. But um, I, at the same time, there are other factors which I no doubt Tom and, and David will have opinions on if uh, we're able to get them. But just in terms of the, the headline, so Russian forces have struck poor infrastructure in Ukraine's southern Mykolaiv region, according to the mayor there. Uh, he has told the Ukrainian state television, uh, releasing a video of nine separate explosions. He said, and I quote, a massive missile strike was launched on the south of Ukraine from the direction of the Black Sea and with the use of aviation. Now, as I say, this cast doubt on the plan to restart Ukrainian grain exports, particularly after the strike on Odessa on Saturday, which we discussed yesterday. And I think this will no doubt cause considerable consternation in Istanbul. Of course, uh, Turkey brokered this deal and, of course, the UN as well. But as I say, there are multiple reasons, as to, I think, as to why this may well be happening. Uh, one is, of course, as I say, that the the amount of time that Russia have had to be able to prepare for such strikes gained, of course, by uh, the, the length of time to be negotiating this or it could well be um, miscalculated you know generals operating in a way that goes against the grain deal but that seems unlikely so numerous questions to be asked but no doubt Russia and Moscow will have excuses as to what is occurring. Certainly and I know that on our live blog we will have more updates on the impact of those strikes exactly where they've struck so do head to our live blog for that information. Now, we've been talking about the grain deal. Today, we've also had a sort of gas deal, but that's between members of the EU. Francis, can you tell us a bit more? I know that the strike in Mykolaiv kind of came as Zelensky called Russia's overt gas war a form of terrorism, but we've had lots of developments in re- regarding the EU in relation to that today. Yes, well, I spoke yesterday at length on this issue uh, regarding a proposal by the European Union to cut across the board or to, to, to demand or to ask European Union members to reduce the use of gas by 15 percent, regardless of their dependence on Russian gas. Now, you can imagine that this caused considerable consternation and actually Paris came out and con- came out and condemned this plan as had Greece and Italy and other countries because some of them felt that their reliance on Russian gas was not as severe as, say, Germany, and yet they were being punished in the same way. Um, but as you say, there has been movement on this. So um, within the last couple of hours, the EU has signed off a landmark deal to wean itself off Russian gas um, just hours after Moscow slashed its supply supplies to Europe, reducing it to about 20% of the capacity we understand. It is a watered down deal to cut gas consumption. We understand, as I say, I haven't read all of the fine details yet, but swathes of member states have been offered exemptions after the original proposal for the mandatory cuts triggered such outrage that I've just referred to. We understand that Gazprom used gas deliveries to Europe slashed, as I say, by 80 percent, so that only 20 percent of those would still be being funneled through by Nord Stream 1. And you allude to the marks there by uh, President Zelensky, who, of course, will feel vindicated by 
by this. His line all along has been to say that it is Russia's intention to strangle Europe on energy. That has, of course, been met, as we've alluded to in the past, by considerable scepticism amongst certain capitals in Europe because they've said that, you know, Moscow can't afford to do this. But it would appear that he was right, reducing it to to 20 percent. And of course, we're not even in winter yet. And indeed, if the war does continue to uh, go badly for the Russians, uh, we, we spoke yesterday about the um, counterattack that it would appear the Ukrainians are about to launch or, or, or are in the middle of launching, that they will turn off the gas entirely. So um, there's been, as you can imagine, some considerable reaction to this. German foreign minister has welcomed efforts to coordinate gas saving measures across the EU, stressing that the bloc should stand united as Russia further throttles its gas supply. And I quote, we will not be divided because gas is scarce. Instead, we stand together. And that is the most important signal to the Russian president. Now, we're also hearing again that there has been some movement on this age old question of German nuclear power plants as quite of this deal. So just to offer a little bit more context on this, as part of German strategy, and there's lots of different reasons why this is the case, in the last sort of 10 years or so, they decided to switch off their nuclear power plants. And indeed, the final three were in the process of being switched off, essentially, when the war in Ukraine began. And as you can imagine, that there has been consternation in Europe that that plan was still proceeding, that Germany was still intending to turn off these plants, regardless of the energy crisis. Um, but we're understanding Understanding that this may well, as part of this deal, be a reopening or an extending of those nuclear plants for a duration. Now, as I say, that has not yet been confirmed. Um, but if so, that would be considerable movement from Germany of what its position was before. And indeed, I'm hoping to be able to cover this in a little bit more detail next week. Just quite how Germany got into the position of switching off nuclear power at the very moment, and, and in a say, an increasing reliance on Russia at the very moment moment that uh, the, 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 the war in Ukraine looked like it was about to begin. I think there's a very, very interesting story there that is yet to be fully told and appreciated in the West. But as I say, I think that's a story for another day. Um, just linked to this, um, if I could just um, uh, conclude on this note, talking about sort of German and, uh, and and Russian relationships in the past, which, of course, has been traditionally perhaps closer than, than any other European power. And we understand that the Kremlin has said today that it believes that Germany's former chancellor, Gerhard Schreider, is in Moscow and hasn't ruled out possible contact with him. And I quote, as far as we know, he is in Moscow. Um, there is no such meeting, but we do not rule out possible contact. So again, it, we don't know in what capacity the former chancellor is there, but there could be some significant movement if dialogue is opened up with him. And as I say, we've spoken um, in, about him in the past as being a rather interesting figure on this. Certainly. And it is interesting that the Kremlin has said, as far as we know, he's in Moscow. What, what do you think of that? Well, I mean, I, I think whatever Moscow is putting out, they're having to admit that they know that he's there because it would be pretty bad luck if they said, oh, we had no idea. Um, but at the same time, of course, um, it's very cryptic uh, language. And no doubt um, if there are conversations that are taking place, unless there's something positive for Moscow to spin, then they wouldn't put it out. So I would guess that that's what hence the uh, rather cryptic remark. Another weapon that we have spoken about for a couple of weeks now on this podcast and has been hugely significant is these high mars missile launchers now we've had an update on these today and just the the power and how they have changed this conflict can you tell us a bit more about that Yes, well, the HIMARS have, of course, been a real game changer. And I would point listeners to our episode yesterday where Dom spoke in more detail about why they are so significant. We've spoken again in the past about this fundamental issue that Ukraine has had in the past month, which is the discrepancy on artillery weaponry when compared to Russia. And I would point listeners to my Twitter feed if you want to see a very interesting chart, um, which just shows that and, and visually the discrepancy discrepancy within the different weapon types and how that has impeded Ukraine up until now. But yes, uh, there has been some some interesting stories that have come out on the HIMARS today. So we understand that uh, the 
these HIMAR missile launchers have destroyed more than 50 Russian ammunition dumps since they arrived on the battlefield last month. This is according to the Ukrainian defence minister. He told Ukrainian television that their accuracy has significantly eroded Russia's supply chains and its ability to conduct, quote, active fighting and cover our armed forces with heavy shelling. Now, I would, again, point listeners to a really interesting piece of analysis on this by our regular contributor to the podcast, Roland Oliphant, Oliphant, who has written a really in-depth piece about why the HIMARS are so significant. And we're also understanding in connection to this that... um, Um, British uh, Stormer anti-aircraft missiles have also arrived in Ukraine. But we are finally starting to see, to your broader question, Sophie, the artillery problem, as it were, being resolved gradually. And of course, it's come at a crucial moment in the war from the Ukrainian perspective because of this problem around artillery, but also when uh, they are about to launch this counterattack on Kherson and other regions, which I think, if those are successful, will be a real game changer from the perspective of there are a lot of countries who have been watching this, I think, in Europe, concerned that there has breached a sort of stalemate. And if it is able to be shown once again that Ukraine is on the offensive, then I think there will be a reignited impetus to offer more weaponry, offer more financial support. But of course, as we're approaching autumn and winter now, there is concern that if the war is going badly for Ukraine, that countries like Germany and others will not necessarily want to throw all of their eggs in one basket when they may well be in such a dire situation, admittedly due to their own fault. Um, that uh, that they will have no choice but to re- reopen negotiations of some kind with, with Russia and Moscow on the energy question. So a very, very significant moment in the war, this, and one that we will obviously be monitoring on a daily basis as we have been so far. Thank you so much, Francis. And there's also another breaking update, which is that the UK has added 42 new designations to its list of Russia sanctions. And um, Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, who we've spoken about a lot on the podcast over the last few days, because she is obviously part of the Tory leadership race and her policy on Ukraine is going to be extremely important to determining who is the next prime minister of the um, United Kingdom. She said, we will not keep quiet and watch Kremlin appointed state actors suppress the people of Ukraine or the freedoms of their own people. We will continue to impose harsh sanctions on those who are trying to legitimise Putin's illegal invasion until Ukraine prevails. That was a quote from her there. So there's 42 new designations, as I said, have been added to the sanctions regime and they also include um, travel bans and asset freezes. Now, Francis, Do you see this as something that has political ramifications on the situation both in the UK and obviously in Ukraine? Well, naturally, it's showing that Britain is still continuing to do what it promised, which is widening out, I suppose, the net, if one can articulate it in that way, of uh, Russian of sanctions on Russian oligarchs or those associated with the regime. Uh, I mean, it seems remarkable, doesn't it? We're just thinking about sanctioning and, 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 and the conversations about particular individuals, it reminds me to those very, very early days of the war. Um, so it just shows how much has happened in, 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 in that intermediate time, because it does feel like a long time ago at least at, at, at least to me that we were talking about Roman Abramovich and, and other obviously senior figures I mean I think there's a broader point here which of course we've touched on in the past but it's worth reiterating which is that really what this war has done has asked the world asked Europe uh, asked America to to for the first time certainly in my lifetime to disentangle itself from the web of globalization that has been a part and parcel of of foreign policy uh, now for this when the foreign policy consensus the liberal consensus one could say ever since the collapse of communism as i say there was this sort of philosophy of the way to change countries the way to bring about a more peaceful world is by extending one's arms and opening one's wallets and that that was enough that it didn't really matter too much about who you were dealing with because money and free exchange of money and 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 sort of ideas that that would be enough to transform countries 
countries like Russia into liberal style democracies. Now, those of us who uh, obviously look at this from a more historical perspective felt that that was rather naive. But um, what we are now, as I say, seeing are countries now trying to disentangle themselves from this very, very complex web of of being intertwined with countries like Russia and like China. I mean, I think it's been very, very noteworthy seeing the extent to which uh, in the um, conservative leadership contest here, Ukraine has not been discussed as heavily, but China has been. Um, Tom Tugendhat wrote, who was one of the candidates and is still the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, wrote a piece for the paper for us yesterday saying that one of the most welcome things that he's seen from the shift Um, in recent months and of course during the um, Conservative leadership contest has been how both of the remaining candidates, Liz Truss, the current Foreign Secretary, and Rishi Sunak, the former Chancellor, are very, very strong on the China issue. That they feel that essentially that China is is the great threat of the future. That of course echoes the remarks made at in Madrid at NATO, which Don was at last month, which, as I've spoken about in the past, is incredibly strong language. It also echoes the remarks that we spoke about last week by the head of MI6. It would appear that there has been an acknowledged at least behind the scenes, that this is all interconnected in some way, that in a sense that there is this broader battle now between autocratic style regimes and sort of democratic capitalism and that we are in a sort of a new world, a sort of Cold War II type situation, whether we like it or not. And that, of course, I think has been was probably inevitable to an extent, but was largely triggered by Ukraine. And I do find it interesting that it's been Ukraine that has triggered this. And obviously on the issue of China, as we spoke about in the past, they have not, whilst not been sort of actively engaged in the war in a way that many feared, they have still been behind closed doors, offering support of Moscow. And even if they're withdrawing financial investment in Russia, I think it's fair to say that they are still more aligned with uh, with, with, with Moscow on this point because of the issues around Taiwan that we've discussed in the past. That essentially the West has sort of woken up to this and, and, and are saying, you know, that unless there is a, a huge shift in axis, that um, we'll be having very, very similar conversations that we're taking place on Russia with with, with China um, on a future invasion of Taiwan. So it's a feeling that everything here is interconnected and that the time to act on this is now. And I think it's been Ukraine that's really offered that existential reflection. Thanks, Francis. And Yesterday, kind of related to that, we saw Zelensky in his nightly address say that Ukrainians were winning and that Putin would not defeat Ukraine. And thanks to these high Mars weapons that have destroyed 50 um, Russian depots, Ukraine were, were almost surefire to win. What's your assessment of that at the moment? Obviously, we have to be aware that for Ukraine and for the country, that, that narrative is extremely important. But where do you stand on the war at the moment before hopefully we speak to Dom and David who are who are there with the Ukrainian people experiencing the war? Well, it's a very big question. I think it depends on certain key questions at this moment, I think. It, the first and foremost one, which we've touched on in the past, is the, na- the extent to which an attritional war favours or doesn't favour Russia. There's one line of thinking, which has been articulated by the Joint Chief of the Defence Staff here in Britain, that Russia actually starts wars badly, but then mobilises its resources and is able to operate more effectively in the latter stages of a war. And that, of course, is true if one looks at the Second World War. To some extent, you could say the First World War, though, of course, it was still very much a disaster for them and, and, and in others. Although I would point to ones like Afghanistan and say, well, it's not always the case that Russia ends wars better than they started them. But that's one school of thought. There's the other school of thought, which is that Russia is continuing to lose more resources than it can sustain in a very, very long term war, that the Ukrainians are effectively destroying um, tanks and advanced weapons that are not easily replaceable, that the manpower issue is hugely significant and that uh, unless Putin eventually mobilizes the entire armed forces then and, and, and launches a general mobilization, that it will there will be a culmination point when Russia will no longer be able to fight. I should say the reason we didn't reach that culmination point, which we certainly would have um, based on the on the losses that we've discussed in the past, the Russian losses, is because, of course, the Russian strategy changed. 
they went from launching all out offensives across the country, of course, in Kiev particularly, um, and then they decided they would focus all of their attention on the Donbass and would fight a more creeping style of war with heavy artillery bombardments, hence the indiscriminate shelling that we've seen, as opposed to fighting with tanks, fighting with in, sort of hand to hand with soldiers get, entering different villages and towns, which is what they did in the initial phase of the war. And so um, it's been that shift. But as I say, there is still a school of thought that says that even though there has been this shift in strategy, that ultimately they will not be able to sustain this in the long run. So I think that is the great unanswered question. And I'm afraid that I don't have an answer to that. But that is the fundamental one that we're posed with at the moment. But the broader question is, is Putin winning? Well, I think in the sense of where the EU and or European, as I say, wider European, because obviously Britain is out of the EU now, um, unity. I think it's still holding much more strongly than he ever anticipated. I mean, you look at the the um, deal that's been struck today on energy. That, of course, will be a big blow to him. Of course, Finland and Sweden joining NATO is again a massive uh, blow. So I think in all of the big picture stuff, you have to say that there's still been an unmitigated disaster, and it, as as well, of course, the uh, devastation that's been brought to Russia's image internationally but also its military prowess I mean it's remarkable the extent to which the R- Russian military capability now is open for questioning uh, when the war started there was really an assumption that, that Ukraine would fall within three days um, and uh, four days and that has not proven to be the case so of course that's a very very um, significant um, so on that side of things of course Russia have been humiliated by this and so I think that on the broad brush you have to say that and acknowledge that however um, Putin's strategy clearly from the beginning was one that said, well, if things do go wrong, is the European resolve, the Western resolve there in the long, long term for a very long war? That question, I think, is more open ended at this moment. Yes, European unity and an outright condemnation of the war has continued. But if we do reach winter, as I say, and Germany is facing the kind of recession, the kind of job losses, the kind of measures on the population that some are predicting, that may well very, very quickly change the mentality in Berlin and in other European capitals when this really, really begins to bite. Because it's not just an issue of of, of people sort of suffering and and, and uh, food prices going up and energy prices soaring, etc. It's also that these... In democracy, this is one of the differences between, of course, uh, Russia's uh, Putin state and, and, and democratic countries is that, you know, leaders need to be reelected and they'll be looking at the election cycles, as terrible as it sounds, and saying we cannot win an election if we face this kind of implosion and, and that the people will not vote for us. And that will be something that will be of, of, of outright concern and may well lead to certain concessions to Russia that I don't I, I personally think it's very unlikely that there will be a desire to sell out. Zelensky sell out Ukraine on the issue of energy. But there are ways of, 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 of doing things that can mean that more pressure is put on Zelensky to do things or to not do things, which ultimately end a war prematurely or in a manner that means that Putin is perhaps able to say that he has achieved certain successes in the Donbass, where maybe it would be holding on to territory, etc., that then enables this war to end in a sort of stalemate of sorts or be paused in some way um, and we're left in, with a an un- unresolved conflict which then eventually is perhaps resumed in some way when Russia feels that it's adapted its capabilities once again and has a new strategy and I think that's the he- and, and it, all credit to Vladimir Zelensky in that he has clearly acknowledged very early on that uh, that is the big risk that there is some sort of peace deal that is signed with Russia that, of course, many other Ukrainian leaders, were it not him there in that position, may well have signed that that in in theory um, sort of led both sides to move away and say they've achieved some success. But then, of course, Russia renewed the war in two, three years time and we're back to where we were, but perhaps in a more serious situation. So he's been very, very alert to that and has been very open about that risk. And I think that that the West has been receptive to his remarks as a consequence of that. And that is a true sign of of his impressive leadership, I think, is that he's been able to see, whilst a lot of other European leaders have not been able to see Hi, um, just the just, so oh, to, hello so david is here um, no no please so uh, dom and i are just opposite on the other side of the table from vitaly klitschko we've been talking to him for 30 minutes uh vitaly klitschko the mayor of kiev uh hi one we are right now in ukraine 
in Ukraine, one of the biggest country in Europe where right now the biggest war after the Second World War. And right now, uh, in this war, killed thousands and thousands of people. We don't know exactly the numbers, but uh, it's a big disaster. Big disaster not just for Ukrainians. It's a big disaster for whole Europe, whole world. And I hope the Russians understand very soon. It's big disaster also, big tragedy also for the Russians. We have to do it everything to stop this senseless war. It's very important. And this war can touch everyone. It will be biggest mistake to think the war is far away from me. It doesn't touch me personally. Because this war can touch everyone in Europe. Please don't forget Ukraine is one of the largest countries in Europe. And instability can bring instability in Ukraine can be, uh, bring instability in the uh, whole region. And uh, please don't forget, Ukraine have uh, a lot of nuclear plants, and one of them was in the fire. Its explosions uh, will be it will be much bigger tragedy than Chernobyl catastrophe. And in this case, this war can touch everyone in our planet. Please be proactive. Do it everything to stop the war, to make a pressure to Russian Federation to stop this senseless war, genocide of Ukrainian population. Thank you for, uh, thank you for everyone who is still proactive, who do it everything to save our world and save lives of human, of people, of Ukrainians. As David said, he and Dom sat down with Vitaly Klitschko to record an extended interview this afternoon, and you'll be able to hear that on tomorrow's episode. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so that you don't miss it. David and Dom aim to join us every day, live from Ukraine. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. We're especially interested to hear where you're listening from around the world. And if you're in Ukraine, keep an eye out for our two intrepid reporters. Thanks to Louisa Wells, Giles Gear, and Carla Abreu for producing this episode.